Sorry, I was caught in a deep slumber, uh, from which I'm only now awakening. Oh, wait a second, I have 10,000 subscribers. Thank you all so much, that's a huge milestone. And I need to celebrate, I should probably celebrate. Okay, so to celebrate, what I'll be doing is a Q&A. Any questions you have about anything at all that pertain to me, my life, my dog? <laughs> my opinion on German unification? My opinion on the domestication of raccoons? My opinion on American politics? I, uh, actually, don't ask me that last one. But whatever questions you have, leave them in the comments below and I'll get to them in my upcoming Q&A. Second important life update that I should probably tell you all is that I'm currently doing my master's degree. It's a master's of arts in psychotherapy, meaning after I'm done, I'll be able to register as a psychotherapist. But I won't be able to register as a Jungian analyst because in Canada, you need to be 40 before you can start training as a Jungian analyst. At first I thought this was kind of stupid, but uh, now I understand the logic of it because it's only when you're in the second half of life that the process of individuation turns inwards. Jung himself believed that his branch of psychology, Jungian psychology, was mostly applicable for older people. When he dealt with younger patients, uh, it was mostly Freudian and Edlerian thinking that guided his treatment of the patient. Okay, so anyways, what is this video about? Well, for a while I haven't felt much motivation to make a video. There was no topic for me that was really gripping. Now I should also issue an apology, because one of the worst things about this channel is that I make a lot of unfulfilled promises. I start a series, but then never finish it. I promise that I'll make a video in the future, but then never get around to it. And I really do want to discuss all of these things that I promised to discuss. Um, it's just that I'm a person who relies a lot on my own intrinsic motivation. And so the, if the motivation to do a video isn't there, it just isn't going to happen. So please be patient with me. I hope that I will get to all of these topics eventually, um, but it might take some time. But in the meantime, I want to discuss how I gained the motivation to do this video, the one that you're currently watching. So a few of my older videos on YouTube consistently get new views. And I can see these on my YouTube studio page. One of these videos is something like um, Carl Jung and Religion, uh, the Introduction to the Psychology of Religion. I think that's what it's titled. And somebody left this comment underneath, which reads, It seems incredibly silly to me to blame depression in an industrial society on a lack of religion. You're made to be a small cog in a large apparatus that consumes for the sake of it and profits those that own it mostly, and you get some token compensation. It's not fulfilling work most of the time. It isn't hard to see why people aren't happy in that world. The fact that religion makes a false reality for people to hide in doesn't mean it was the solution. Every time you say something about science, you're as wrong as someone can be. Science and religion are as opposed as two things can be. Okay, so it's a bit too long to read the whole thing in a single sitting. But after reading this, I suddenly had the motivation to do a video. How about that? And I plan to thank this commenter afterwards and hopefully they will see this video. So thank you very much, sir or ma'am. I owe you a lot. And I hope you enjoy this video. So a point that I made in the original video right at the start is that it's wrong to think of religion and science as forming a dichotomy as if they're exact opposites. This becomes quite clear when you examine any particular religion and even ask the question, what is a religion and what encompasses a religion? But if you're raised in the modern secular world, you may have been introduced to this notion of science being necessarily in conflict with religion. And now that we have science, we don't need religion anymore. I think that if you have a very surface layer understanding of what religion is, um, and perhaps an oversimplified view of what religion is, you can come to this conclusion. But the more you know about religion, which is a very complex phenomenon, the more you realize that this statement can't really make sense. If you want to get a better grasp of what religion is, it's important to not just look at the mainstream religions of Christianity and Islam, but go beyond that and understand religion in its historical context. Try to look at uh, more ancient religions that existed, like the ancient Egyptian religion. Try to look into things like shamanism or various animistic religions, um, or religions that are practiced in Asia, like Shinto and uh, and uh, Taoism. This will give you a wider understanding of the diversity of religions. Rather than thinking of religion as merely Christianity or merely Islam, this wide diversity of things that we call religion shows that it isn't straightforward to merely claim that science is the opposite of religion because religions themselves are extremely diverse and religions are also internally diverse. So it's hard to make generalizations about Christianity, for example, because there's so many different forms of Christianity. It'll probably be important to define science for the sake of this video. And we can say that science is a rigorous and systematic endeavor that develops knowledge by forming testable hypotheses and then using the experimental method to test these hypotheses. Science first and foremost uses the scientific method to gain information about the universe. So if you think that religion is the opposite of science, it's essentially positing that religion is similar enough to science 
in that it's also a way to gain knowledge about the world. But this is wrong because it presupposes that religion is just pre-scientific science. Like at some point humans needed to explain the natural world, so they invented religion. And religion helps us explain things like where the earth came from or why snakes don't have legs. But now that we have science, we don't need religion because science can systematically explain the natural world. This idea is false, or rather oversimplified, for a lot of reasons. But to put it into perspective, I would say that religion has a lot more in common with like art or law than it does with science. Would a person ever say that art is the opposite of science? Like what does that even mean? It's hard to compare the two because they're completely different endeavors that have very little to do with each other. And usually when we say that something is the opposite of something else, it's implying that they exist on the same epistemic plane, or what Bernardo Kastrup calls epistemic symmetry. This essentially means that the absence of one of the opposites implies the presence of the other. So if something isn't hot, it's cold, at least in a relative sense. If something isn't alive, it's dead. Therefore, alive and dead are opposites. So if something isn't scientific, does that necessarily mean it's religious? That doesn't sound exactly right. And it can't be right because they're not opposites. Now I should be clear at the outset that I'm not against science at all. I love science. I spend way too much time looking at the uh, latest scientific developments in astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology. And also I am a scientist. I've been working as a scientist for the past eight months and I've even submitted a scientific paper which will hopefully be published soon. So I'm very much familiar with science and the scientific method. And it's my familiarity with both science and religion which causes me to make the claims in this video. I should also add that I'm not like over pro-religious. This video will probably come off as a defense of religion, but that's only because it's addressing a claim which is often presented as an attack on religion. But in the end, I am just trying to be descriptive of things. I do have opinions about religion. I do believe religion can be a positive influence, especially at the psychological level. But it can also be very dangerous because of how psychologically potent it is. The thing that makes religion so potent psychologically is also something that can make it potentially very dangerous. And I do want to discuss what I think are the negative aspects of religion, in my opinion, in a future video, uh, but this video in particular will just respond to a particular claim. So let's start by evaluating the idea that religion and science are opposites. When people posit that religion is the opposite of science, they are usually referring to various explanations for things that you can find in religious texts which make claims about the natural world. So for example, in the Bible we have the creation story of Genesis which explains how the world came to be and it supposedly explains the origins of humans and life on earth. So here we do have an example of a claim about the natural world being made in a religious text which is meant to explain the origins of the universe. So when someone says that religion is the opposite of science, this is what they usually mean. That you can find certain claims about the natural world in religion which are just stated as a matter of fact, without proof or evidence, and these claims can be shown, using science, to be false. Or more accurately, science is able to posit better hypotheses and back these hypotheses up with much more evidence than, for example, the idea of creationism. And so you should believe the scientific account of the Big Bang or evolution because it actually has evidence backing it up. So that settles it, right? Religion says one thing, science says something else, they contradict, which means they're opposites. Except the problem with this is that it's a very oversimplified view of religion to treat it as just a bunch of claims about the world that are used to explain things. It's hard to define exactly what a religion is. I recommend viewing this video from one of my favorite YouTubers to see why, but I think it's best to define re religion in terms of family resemblances. That way we can speak about different things being religions even if they are rather distinct. So obviously that can encompass a lot of things, but what I, what I hope is that what I'm saying is generally true of most religions. I'll forego a definition of religion for the sake of brevity and just refer you to that video, but religion can't merely be characterized as a bunch of claims about how things work in the natural world. If you read the Bible, it's not like you're reading a list of pseudoscientific explanations for why things are the way they are. It's not like the Bible starts with, and the reason it's cold at the North Pole is because God needed a place to chill. And the reason there are no reptiles at the North Pole is because God is not very fond of reptiles and he didn't want them in his chill space. And the reason sugar dissolves in water is because God deemed that sugar and water should love each other so much that when they come into contact, they fuse into one substance. So if you think religion is just a bunch of claims about how things work, you're very mistaken. The vast majority of religious texts don't try to explain natural phenomena in this way. To treat religion as merely being a bunch of explanations for things without the rigor of the scientific method is just demonstrably false. You might think that creation stories are an exception to this because you will often see in creation stories things like um, how the moon came to be or how the stars came to be. For example, there's a Mayan mythology 
that attempts to explain the moon as being the decapitated head of a great warrior. But even this myth is not primarily concerned with explaining the origins of the moon. Almost all creation stories, as demonstrated by Ernst Cassier, are concerned more with the origins of consciousness, not in a direct, systematic way, but in a symbolical way. It's like a creature that was suddenly endowed with self-awareness is trying to piece together how it can be self-aware. And creation stories are usually symbolic stories depicting how consciousness arises in a psychological sense. And they do so because such stories are ultimately derived from the human mind itself. And so features of the human mind are evident in these stories. For example, the story of Adam and Eve is an incredibly rich allegory about the state of human self-awareness and why it's such a burden. If you read the story and your main takeaway is that this is how the world came to be and this is how humans came to be, you're arguably missing the main point. Because it's not the fact that this explains where the world came from that caused people in the past to elevate the story and treat it as divine. The reason the story of Adam and Eve is given so much reverence as to be included in the Torah and the Bible and the Quran for that matter is because of its symbolic significance, its deeper meaning so to speak. And I give a glimpse of what that deeper meaning is in this video. And in a significant number of creation stories, it's the deeper psychological significance of the story that causes it to be worshipped. Not the fact that they told us where the moon and the earth and the sun came from. Furthermore, creation stories are only ever a minor part of religion. So if you think of religion and your first thought is creationism, I would characterize that as an oversimplification. A religion is much more than merely the creation story which appears at the beginning of the religious text. This is not to say that religious people are always aware of the fact that the stories are metaphorical. A large number of religious people do believe that the creation story is literal history. But the reason the story is seen as so profound and has this psychological effect is because of its symbolic content. If I just made up a story right now about where the universe came from, do you think people would just start flocking to me and that I would be able to start a new religion? Probably not. And the reason is because the story itself has to have something which operates at the unconscious level for people to start seeing it as divine and revelatory, even if they aren't directly aware of what that is. So if you think that the Bible is just a list of explanations for things that could otherwise be tested and proven by science, you probably just haven't read it. And this goes for a significant number of religious texts. The Quran, the Vedas, the Guru Granth Sahib, which actually doesn't even have a creation story in it. And by the way, that's the primary religious text of Sikhism. The Prose Edda, even things like the Iliad, which a lot of people don't think of as a religious text, but it definitely was for the people in ancient Greece who saw it as divine. Thinking that religion is like this really gives the wrong impression about what a religion even is. When a person attends mass, I don't think he's thinking in the back of his mind, Man, I really hope the priest explains how magnets work because I'm so confused. In my experience, and you can tell me if your experience is different, most things priests talk about are related to things like how to fix your marriage or how to grieve a loved one, things that pertain to more spiritual matters, not naturalistic phenomena. So if arbitrary explanations for why trees are made of bark or where lightning comes from aren't the main constituent of religious texts, what is? Most religious texts are either allegorical, i.e. they're more or less just storybooks, or they are proscriptive and set out rules for people to follow. This is why I say that religion has more in common with art and law than it does with science. Let's start with the first thing, allegory. Religions are filled with mythological allegories. Now these stories serve all kinds of functions in culture and even in politics. For example, the story of the Jews exodusing themselves straight out of Egypt serves as a national founding myth for the ancient Israelites. But over and beyond this, the story itself contains not necessarily truth, but wisdom. And I say not truth because I think the word truth is very nebulous and I agree with Nietzsche's assessment of truth to an extent, but also because it's hard to evaluate the truth of something without referring to like rigid mathematical logic or like the scientific method. But take this example from John chapter 8 verse 3 to 11. The story goes that a woman who was caught in the act of adultery was brought before Jesus and the Pharisees claimed that Moses taught that such a woman should be stoned to death. And then they asked Jesus, what should we do? This was intended to be a trap to get Jesus in trouble with the authorities, but Jesus simply replies, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Now, if you absorb this story, there's something quite profound about it and something quite wise about it. But in what sense is this story true or false? Because many atheists claim that science can prove religious claims wrong, but in what sense can this claim be shown to be wrong? Can you show that Actually, the person who should cast the first stone is the guy with the biggest arms, duh. Science can't really approach a claim like this because it's not really a claim about the world. And the deeper wisdom of the story is the really profound thing about it. 
Not whether it's scientifically true or not, because again, it's not really within the purview of what science can demonstrate. Through this story, Jesus is trying to show us that we're all sinners. It's a story about forgiveness as well as not choosing violence, which is consistent with Jesus' philosophy. Now, an interesting thing about this story is that it seems to be a relatively late addition to the Gospels. In other words, this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees probably didn't happen. And yet, the story still stands as something we can reflect on and think about and which still has a deep message to tell us. So in what way can science probe this story? It can't because it's a story. Let's do an example from something which people often disentangle from religion, and that's Greek mythology. It's clear that a lot of ancient mythology is still studied and analyzed by undergraduate classicists, not for its ability to explain the natural world, but because of the deeper significance, its allegorical significance, the fact that it relates to our lived experience and illuminates aspects of the human condition. One such story is the myth of Demeter and Persephone, which I discussed in my video about the Eleusinian mysteries. I'm not gonna explain the story in any detail. A, a quick YouTube search will yield some great videos that describe the myth, but it's easy to see this myth as entirely an attempt to explain why there are seasons, because the myth does do that. It does give an explanation for a natural phenomenon. But the evidence that this is not what the myth was primarily for is the fact that we know what causes the seasons. We've scientifically verified it, and yet we still read the story. The story still exists in our culture, and we haven't just dispensed with it. Why? Because the story has a deeper allegorical, metaphorical meaning, which instills us with wisdom. The seasons are being used as a metaphor to illuminate something about human psychology, something about the way we grieve and the way we move through emotions. On a deeper level, it interacts with our unconscious psychology. To put it in simpler terms, this means that for the ancient Greeks who revered the story and revered the gods and goddesses that feature in it, the effect it would have had upon their minds would be something that they were unaware of. They simply experienced a beautiful story and felt something. They felt some deeper connection to it. It's very similar to how any movie feels. If you're watching a really good movie, you're like engrossed in it. You're not like consciously aware of every feature of the movie that's making you happy. It's a very unconscious experience. It's very emotional. And it's that feeling that the ancient Greeks would have attributed to the divine. That's why ancient people revered mythology, because for them, it seemed genuinely transcendental. You can check out the video that I made to get a deeper sense of what this meaning actually was. So with that said, in what sense can you say the story is false? Well, you can say that it's false because the seasons aren't really caused by goddesses leaving the underworld after being kidnapped. Spoiler alert. So in that sense, it's false. But can you say that the wisdom the story reveals is false? Even if you make that claim, it's not a claim you can validate scientifically. Same with the story I mentioned earlier about Jesus. You might disagree and argue that the woman should be stoned for committing adultery. But you aren't making a claim based off of science. You're making a claim based off of values or off of morals, which can't be determined scientifically. And this attempt to use science to prove that religion is wrong would be like trying to use science to prove fiction wrong. Like, what does that even mean? Imagine, for example, I asked my friend, hey, do you like Lord of the Rings? No, the Lord of the Rings is wrong. Wait, what? I mean, it's just not true. It's just not a true story. Um, if you were in this situation, would you not be dumbfounded? The fact that the story is fictional doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the story or that the story doesn't give you anything. There's a deeper meaning in the story, which is conveyed by the way it unfolds. What I'm claiming is that much of religion is really just a fan club for certain stories that are deemed to be so profound that we worship them. The story of King David, the story of Hercules, the story of Rama. All of these are just good, engaging stories that have been elevated by religion. There's another sense, however, in which religion can be said to be false from a scientific point of view. Sort of. It's more of a historical point of view, but scientific in the sense that history has become a very rigorous discipline, which has many of the features of science. And this is the historical sense. So let's take an example from Hinduism. The Mahabharata is an important Hindu text, which is revered religiously by many Hindus. In fact, I will admit that I revere the story because it's just so cool and epic, but it's making a claim about historical events. The events depicted in the story are described as events which really took place. But did they take place? The answer is, Maybe. The story is about a succession crisis, and so it's possibly based on a real historical war. But we can't really say that this is an accurate depiction of what happened because it involves supernatural weapons and gods directly interacting with the characters. It's also very specific, and so it's hard to believe someone accurately depicting exactly what happened with that level of detail. So that means that the story is semi-legendary, perhaps inspired by true events, but ultimately fictional. So does that itself discredit religion? The fact that it claims that these are historical events when it seems like they were largely made up. 
Well, again, it's the story itself and the wisdom it has which lends credence to the elevation of the text to the status of something divine. When you read the story, it doesn't feel like a first-hand account of historical events. It feels like an epic drama, and that's more characteristic of religion. But this is generally the case with religious texts that have some history in them. The Bible is filled with many events, some of which happened, some of which didn't happen, and many of which are semi-legendary, i.e. they relate to things that happened but are also mythological. The Iliad is another example. Historical evidence suggests that the Trojan Wars did happen, but it's unlikely that they happened in exactly the way depicted in the story. But the way the story unfolds, even if it's fictional, is filled with a deeper message about the nature of fate and destiny. Just read the original accounts of Alexander the Great. Well, to be clear, there are no surviving original accounts of Alexander the Great. What we have are accounts that were copied from original accounts. But even so, it's obvious that Alexander the Great was a real person, but the accounts of his life read more like mythology than actual history. But remember, Alexander the Great was worshipped as a god. He had his own temples and religious practices. And what this shows is that myth and legend are fundamental to religion, because the symbolical significance of the story is the main thing that's emphasized, not whether it's an accurate depiction of history. Now, another major reason why religious texts shouldn't just be seen as scientific texts conducted by bad scientists is because a large proportion of religious texts are proscriptive. They set out standards for conduct rather than being descriptive. And you can't prove or disprove a proscriptive claim. So for example, the proscriptive claim that one can derive from the story of Jesus I mentioned earlier is that we should try to forgive other people. But is that true? Should we try to forgive other people? I mean, you might think it sounds true, but it can't be true in a scientific sense because that means you would be able to perform an experiment to prove that it's true. But that just doesn't make sense. A proscriptive or normative claim for you philosophers just tells us what we ought to do, how we ought to behave. If you want to argue that you should forgive others, you would have to argue that it's morally correct, which again is not a claim that can be evaluated by science, despite what Sam Harris may try to claim. I'll do a few more examples. One of the five pillars of Islam is Salat, which means you need to pray five times a day. So if you're a Muslim, your religion dictates that you must pray five times a day. Now, would it make sense to ask as a question, is this true? The question doesn't make sense because it's just telling a person how they should act. It isn't describing a state of things, it's just dictating what a person should do. Science can't evaluate the claim that you should pray five times a day because science can't prescribe anything. Science is just a systematic method for evaluating descriptive hypotheses. We can evaluate a claim about a cause and effect relationship because that's descriptive. So for example, if the Quran said you should pray five times a day because doing so relieves back pain, now you have a claim that can be tested scientifically because it associates an effect, less back pain, with a cause, praying five times a day. But first, science still wouldn't be able to tell you that you should pray five times a day, even if you confirm that doing so relieves back pain because science can't give you proscriptive claims. It can be used to justify proscriptive claims, but it can't give them to you. And so most of the proscriptions which exist in religious texts are prescribed on moral grounds. So for example, another pillar of Islam is sakat, which means almsgiving or giving a portion of your wealth to charity. Sakat isn't justified in terms of a cause and effect relationship. It's just said to be the morally right thing to do. So all of these prescriptions, which make up a significant proportion of religious texts, are usually justified on moral grounds. Do this because God has deemed that it's the right thing to do. When I say that religion is more akin to law than it is to science, this is what I mean. The Quran largely reads like a law code, explaining how to act and how to behave. Same with the Bible. Amidst all of the allegories, there's also a statement about conduct proscriptive claims rather than descriptive claims. The Ten Commandments don't tell us what the world is like. They tell us how a person should act if they want to act morally. Now, sometimes these moral justifications are built on cause and effect claims, which technically are valuable. For example, Jesus claims that if you're rich, you will have a hard time getting into heaven. In fact, the probability of you getting into heaven should be lower than the probability of a camel fitting through the eye of a needle. So there we go. We have a testable hypothesis. All you need to do is measure the number of rich people that go to heaven and try sticking as many camels through needle eye holes as possible. And if the probability of a rich person going to heaven is less than the camel thing, well, you've done it. You've proven the claim true. Except obviously you can't really evaluate this claim because it's more of a metaphysical claim, which makes a claim about what happens to you after you die. But since you need to die in order to be able to test the claim, it doesn't seem that this is a scientifically testable claim. It might be true and it might not be true, but you wouldn't be able to use science to tell. So you do have metaphysical claims in religion, for example, Christianity and Judaism, about things that will cause you to go to hell or cause you to go to heaven. And these are either true or not, so in a sense they're descriptive. But they're still descriptive claims that can't be evaluated by science. Even the claim that heaven exists or hell exists 
both of which are implied in the Bible, are either true or not true, so they're descriptive, but you can't use science to prove them true or false. So if you decide that you don't believe in heaven, you can't be rejecting the idea of heaven on scientific grounds, because science can't evaluate the claim. It simply doesn't know. You'd be rejecting it for other reasons, such as rationality, and that's totally fine. You can be rational and you can re use reasoning to come to your own conclusions. That's perfectly fine, but people should realize that rationality and science are not at all the same thing. Science is empirical. It's based on observations. Rationality is based on reasoning within your own mind. And it's okay to use rationality to come to such conclusions, but it would be wrong to say that because you've used rationality to come to such conclusions, that science also supports such conclusions. It just doesn't. Furthermore, if I go back to that story one more time, it's pretty obvious that it's just a metaphor. I don't think Jesus is literally suggesting the camel thing. The story is obviously being used as a metaphor to convey that wealthy people have a hard time getting into heaven. And many allegories have this metaphorical character. They aren't meant to be taken literally. So I would argue that the vast majority of religious claims are about morals, about how we ought to live, what we ought to do. I claimed earlier that science can't really tell us how we ought to live, and this is a fact. Science is a powerful tool for determining descriptive claims, but because of this, it won't ever be able to generate a proscriptive claim, unless we presuppose some kind of moral value beforehand. So for example, science can show that smoking is causatively linked to lung cancer. And you might think of this as an example of science determining what we should do proscriptively, i.e. it tells us not to smoke. But it didn't tell us not to smoke, it only told us the chain of cause and effect. If we decide not to smoke, we would be doing so for a moral reason. So that moral reason might be because I value my health, or I don't want to get lung cancer, or even uh, I don't want to be a burden on my family in the future. Therefore, I will not smoke. So science can be used to justify a proscription, but doing so always presupposes that you are acting with the moral goal in mind. If you had a different moral, for example, if you didn't care about lung cancer and you just prefer to smoke because it, it energizes you and you can work more productively, you aren't doing something that was shown by science to be wrong. You are just using a different moral belief to guide your actions. In this case, the moral belief that productivity is more important. But the scientific claim still holds. Now, morals pertain directly to another important feature of religion, which very much distinguishes it from science, and that's religious practices. These are often tied to moral beliefs, but they are also very much at the core of what a religion is apart from religious texts. And they show that religion and science can't really be compared because there's no equivalent in science. Are there practices proscribed by science? And are these practices true practices, whereas religious practices are false? A practice can't be true or false for the same reason a moral belief can't be true or false. And science doesn't tell you what practices you should follow, unless, again, you presuppose a moral belief. Do you want to avoid cavities? Well, that's a moral belief. Did you know that brushing your teeth is one way to avoid cavities? That's a scientific fact. And I can use that scientific fact in conjunction with my moral belief to practice the act of brushing my teeth. And this points to another reason why science and religions shouldn't be considered as opposites. It's because they can act in conjunction with each other with no contradiction. For example, meditation is a Buddhist religious practice. And there are various kinds of meditation, but science has shown many benefits of mindfulness meditation. The fact that meditation was originally a religious practice doesn't conflict with anything science has to say about the benefits of meditation. In fact, they go hand in hand. If religion was really the opposite of science, wouldn't they be incompatible in a sense? Another example, Christianity places an emphasis on helping people who are suffering from sickness, and so it is morally the right thing to do. Historically, Christian religious orders and institutions have played a significant role in the development of hospitals and healthcare systems. Many modern hospitals have Christian origins and, and continue to operate under the Christian principles of compassionate care. That's why many churches are named St. Mary's or St. Michael's. A significant amount of science is conducted with this in mind trying to find cures for diseases to help the sick. You could argue here that a Christian moral belief is being used to guide the hand of science, and scientific discoveries are being used to further a religious moral goal. So if religion and science are opposites, how is it possible for them to work in conjunction like this? And this is clear when you consider that a different moral goal might be driving research into medicine. For example, if the pharmaceutical industry just wants to make a lot of money, that's a different moral belief that's guiding science. But religious practices show that religions are as much characterized by actions as they are by beliefs. Other practices include things like burying the dead, something which is deeply tied to religion and is entirely symbolic and is a reflection of the fact that we're grieving creatures and can suffer immensely from losing our loved ones. Religious practices that concern death and burial are usually meant to help us through the process of grief. 
And it's not like you can determine the correct way to bury someone using science. Marriage, too, has been a largely religious institution, which creates a metaphysical union between two people. The practice of marriage is an act, a religious act, but in what sense can you say that it's false or wrong? If you believe that marriage is wrong, it's because you have a moral belief about it. Science might be able to justify this moral belief, but it can't give you the moral belief. Religious practices have various psychological effects as well. When you partake in a religious celebration with other people and sing, dance, and eat together, there is this feeling of participation in a community, which humans very often crave. Not me though, I'm a lone individuated ubermensch who's not secretly sad about my lack of friends. But things like Shinto practices, which are highly varied and involve various rituals like visiting sacred spaces and giving and making offerings to kami. The word kami can be translated roughly as like spirit um, or gods. But practices like these are fundamental to religion, much more so than pseudo-scientific claims about the world. Now one interesting thing about Shinto to close off this discussion, and this pertains to all religions, um, is that kami or spirits in Shinto can exist in all sorts of places and be associated with lots of different uh, ideas or um, objects or uh, locations. So for example, a particularly old and ancient tree might be revered as a kami. Now here's a question I want to pose. Is viewing an object as a kami false? Because it is or isn't a kami, right? This is an interesting question, but what I want to say is that when we view something as sacred, it's an intersubjective phenomenon. This means that the way you view the object will change your relationship to it. Seeing a kami as a tree might be the wrong way to view it if you're an atheist, but viewing it as just a bunch of particles is really just another way to see it, a materialistic way. And if you see the tree as being merely a resource to be extracted, that's another way of viewing it. None of these can be said to be the correct way to view the tree because each of them is subjective. If you choose to view the tree as a kami, then you will treat it as such. If you view the tree as a resource, you'll treat it very differently. But again, there's no correct way to see the tree. Such is the case with anything that we choose to see as divine. If I treat a book as divine, it will necessarily appear so to me. If someone views the earth as divine, which many environmentalists kind of do, they are treating it fundamentally differently from something that isn't sacred. The point is that we can subjectively select what we want to view as sacred. And you can't demonstrate that there's a necessarily correct way to view any object or idea or practice or belief. And I would encourage atheists to consider sacralization to be an important feature of religion, which doesn't really have an analog in science. Many scientists spend a lot of time studying endangered species. Why? Because they have made it a moral goal to preserve such species, a goal that I personally support. But doing this is treating these animals as sacred, and that changes how we see them. It makes us less likely to shoot them, for example. So if atheism means an absence of many of the features of religion, such as sacralization, you're giving up on a very potent human force which can fundamentally change our relationship to the objects of the world. So even if you are an atheist, I wouldn't necessarily give up on the concept of sacralization. Because it's our desacralization of nature which causes us to exploit nature as just a resource for profits. It's our desacralization of the rights of other people that causes us to be cruel and dehumanizing. It's our desacralization of things like law and morality that causes moral reversion. So if you're an atheist, that's fine. I love many atheists who are my close friends and family, but atheism doesn't have to necessarily mean hating religion. Because if you dispense with some of the features of religion, it will have potentially very dangerous consequences. So anyways, this concludes this long ass discussion. I hope I intrigued some of you. I hope I got my point across. Again, comments down below are for my Q&A. And also please leave me a comment telling me what you thought about this topic in general, whether you had your own thoughts or if you disagree, which I'd especially love to hear because you might have a convincing reason and which I hadn't considered, so I'd love to hear it. But yeah, anyways, have a good day and may good luck always come your way.